I'm delighted that we have um, to, uh, with us here today uh, Dina Mohammed. She will be joining us remotely and I will be spot spotlighting her uh, in just one second. And she's a Cairo based uh, Egyptian illustrator and graphic designer as well. And her graphic novel trilogy, Shubake Lubeik, um, is an urban fantasy about wishes. Um, the first volume was actually awarded um, the best graphic novel prize and the grand prize of the Cairo Comics Festival in 2017. So we're really excited that Dina has accepted our invitation to be here today. Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Dina Mohammed, uh, and as Thir just said, I am an Egyptian comics artist and designer and illustrator, and I'm really, really delighted and honored to be here today. Uh, so I will be, <laughs> I will be talking to you guys about Tutankhamun, but in order to get there, I do have to explain what my graphic novels are about. Um, so just to contextualize this presentation, uh, my graphic novels are a an urban fantasy trilogy, um, but they are about a world where you can buy and sell wishes. Uh, and as you can see in the presentation, the wishes are sold in bottles and they're the more expensive they are, the more powerful they are. So if you buy a really cheap third class wish, then it will function as a monkey's paw. It might trick you, like if you wish to lose weight, your arms and legs would fall off. But if you buy a first class wish, which is sold in bottles, like the ones on the covers, they will actually grant exactly what you want. Uh, and the idea of the graphic novels is that um, there is this man who owns a kiosk in Cairo, like a corner store, Kushk. I mean, most of you have been to Egypt, so you probably know what the Kushk is. Um, but it's uh, he has three first class wishes, but he doesn't want to use them because he thinks wishes are haram. Um, but because he's in debt, he decides to sell them at a huge discount. Uh, so each one of the stories is about where each of these three wishes goes. Um, and so my graphic novel, it was published in three parts in Arabic and the English version is hopefully coming soon. These are the covers for the US and UK version. The one on the right is for the UK, the one on the left is for the US. Um, so it has been translated. Uh, and today I'm gonna be talking to you guys about a particular illustration from part three, uh, which Eleanor asked me to discuss. Uh, so this page is actually the third page of the third part. The English versions are a collected volume, so you don't actually uh, get the separations. Like you get all three parts in one book. So just for comparison, so this is the English. It's like this big. And then these are the Arabic versions. They're like three different parts. So this is the third page of the third part. Um, it's right here. Oh, can you guys actually see me? I don't know if you can see me or the presentation. Yes, we uh, can see you. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> that makes, that helps. Um, so this book is about the owner of the kiosk. He's the, the third part is actually about him finding out how his father came to have three first class wishes that he gives to him. Because again, the context is that in these books, a first class wish is like worth a million dollars. And this is a man who owns a kiosk. So if he has like three first class wishes, um, that's a lot of money that he's not really using. Um, and this particular illustration, it's uh, the page before that, it says that it's in 1954. Um, and it is the introduction of the third part where I'm explaining how the owner of the kiosk has these three wishes. So this is in this context of my story, this is a fictional tomb that is discovered on page three of part three. And to be clear, like the parts before that are all set in contemporary Cairo. They're not like, none of them are related to ancient Egypt in any way. And none of them are set in a different time period. So in this page, um, I was really, not just this page, but this part kind of goes back in time for the first time in the trilogy. Um, and for this illustration, I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical aspects of it first, um, which is that I wanted it to be 
a really detailed and kind of splashy page. I wanted it to be sort of um, like a key page almost for this book, uh, which is why I put a lot of time into it. Uh, and I draw all of my pages on, where is he? I draw all of my pages on this program that's called Clip Studio Paint. So this is a screenshot of how I work. This is on my iPad. Uh, and this was when I was, background was constructed first and then I put in the characters and then I was thinking about where to kind of add the, can you guys hear me? Cause it says my connection is a little unstable so I might turn off my camera. Uh, let me see. Can you still hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> uh, let me know if the connection is unstable because the internet is not amazing. Um, but this is essentially how I work. And this is also another screenshot of like halfway through the coloring process. And you, at this point I was realizing how many hieroglyphics I'd committed to and was having some regrets. Um, <laughs> so the thing is like this page, um, like, let me talk a little bit about the research I did for this page. So I wanted to have a tomb in this book. Uh, and before that, I had done a lot of research on Luxor and Gurna and Upper Egypt because the main characters of this book are all Upper Egyptian or um, from Said, and I'm not. Um, well, I am technically, my family is, but I haven't lived there. Uh, so I had actually traveled to Gurna. I'd done a residency there. While I was there, I did not visit a single tomb. Uh, because the research I was doing was more related to people. So I was visiting a lot of people there. I, I visited a lot of families and their homes. And I was learning a lot about uh, the displacement of the people who lived in Gurna. And so it, it was more it was more social and cultural. So I didn't actually go to see any tombs, even though I was staying in the Valley of the Kings, like in, on the West Bank for maybe two, three weeks. Um, so at the time, my only experience with Tutankhamun's tomb was when we would go to the Egyptian museum on field trips. Um, so I don't know if you guys know this, but for most Egyptian school children, we end up going to the Egyptian museum a lot for school trips. Um, and I mainly just remember seeing the mummy room. So when I was a kid, I would I remember it was like a really long wait. So that's the main thing I remembered. Uh, that was pretty much my only memory of Tutankhamun. It wasn't really like, I we knew about the mummy's curse and we knew things about Tutankhamun, but we don't really learn about Egyptology in the same way. And we also don't really learn much about Tutankhamun's life at school. Like he's not a huge part of the Egyptian national curriculum. We mainly learn about the discovery of the tomb and how that was like a big impact worldwide. But we don't really learn a lot about the tomb itself in terms of like the details of it. Um, so like from the Egyptian Museum, this is a picture I took when I went in 2013. So I was around 18. Uh, I went with one of my friends and I remember taking this picture because I thought this structure looked interesting. For some reason, this is one of the very few pictures I took there. I wasn't, I was generally not very interested so when I set out to illustrate this tomb, this is actually, I, I did a lot of visual research. So for most comics artists, what we do is something that's called like gathering references. I did a lot of research for the tomb in that I also watched a lot of videos and I also like did a lot of reading about the discovery of the tomb itself. And like you can see, in this, like, this is a place where I can dump my references and look at them later. Um, so this is a very, this is revealing a very, uh, like, drafty part of the process. But uh, you can see, like, there's screenshots from, like, British past videos. Uh, for some reason, most of the references are British videos. Uh, so I, I did, like, take from a lot of those. Um, and I kind of narrowed it down to these pictures in particular that I was using for that tomb. So you can tell it wasn't mainly like for the illustration itself. 
um, let me go back to it. Here you can see the stuff I used from the tomb was actually mainly in the items that were there. So that's the stuff that I took from Tutankhamun's tomb in particular. But for the structure of the tomb in particular, I used other tombs. So I used other tombs from the Valley of the Kings. Um, one of the Romsises, I will not claim to remember which one it was. I did remember last year. I don't remember now. Um, but these were kind of like the, the most important visual references I, I gathered. Um, and the reason I needed them is because uh, in this illustration, so <laughs> I, do, I do have one thing I wanted to say is that when I was doing this research as someone who had only ever heard about Tutankhamun's tomb in terms of its curse and in terms of like the impact it had on the world, I was actually really surprised when I saw images of the tomb for the first time, because like these images are not really circulated for us, or at least we don't really see them that much in this way, unless you're into Egyptology, which most Egyptians aren't. So one of the things I tweeted was like, I was very surprised by how messy it was. Like I had always had the impression that the things there were laid out like super ritualistically, like very neatly. But then when I saw this tomb, I was like, oh, it looks really, it looks like humans put stuff there. Like, it doesn't look like somewhere that's cursed. Uh, and I tweeted, like, it kind of looks really messy. Like, it, it looks like Egyptians did this. I'm surprised people are like, modern Egyptians and ancient Egyptians aren't the same. Um, but then someone else replied, you kind of half expect to see like, a mop and a broom on the side because this looks like <laughs> exactly like most of our government buildings <laughs> uh, so I was just really I was I was I was surprised by like how demystifying looking at the pictures were like it, it, when I was younger and reading about it I just thought it would be a lot more um I don't know a lot more alien but it just kind of looks very familiar it looks like people put that stuff there I guess, which I hadn't been expecting. Um, and it kind of did help me figure out how I wanted things placed in the tomb that I was drawing. Um, because I, I mean, I know the context under which this tomb is supposedly made and that it's in a hurry and it's a mess and it wasn't meant for Tutankhamun, who's probably moved, but still fine. Um, so the reason I chose that tomb in particular, the structure of the tomb, is that I wanted a very long hallway. Um, and I also wanted one with lots of crevices, which is why when I was looking at my references, I chose um, the Ramses kind of tombs in particular, like the bigger ones. And you, it's kind of obvious from the decorations and the hieroglyphs as well. Um, but it also had to be vague because again, my, my book takes place in a fictional world. So it had to be a kind of amalgamation. So it had to look familiarly ancient Egyptian, but also not a specific tomb. Um, that was important to me because I didn't want to be too accurate because then it would be completely like, it wouldn't make sense to the context of the story too. So the context of this is, this is an Italian kind of uh, Egyptologist, archeologist, and the one next to him is British. Um, and these are both the people in charge of the dig. And this is 1954, so it's not around the same time that Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered. It's a little later. Um, and these are the pages that follow. Um, but the reason it's, it's later is also because essentially they actually do have agreements with the government in that they can take a lot of things, but they, for example, cannot take the mummy from this particular uh, excavation. And the idea is that they find out that all of the containers in there aren't perfume containers, but they actually contain wishes. So it's a wish mine in this story. It's not uh, just like an, an, Egypt, <laughs> an ancient Egyptian tomb. Um, so that's the context of my book not very relevant to all of you, but it is relevant in the sense of uh, the Egyptian, the, the Egyptologist here, he discovers that this is a wish mine. And in the book, Egyptians, because they believe wishes are haram, are not really that interested in wishes. So they're able to kind of take all of these wishes and 
they sort of start their own wish company in Italy. Um, and I, I did kind of want the cooler containers to contain the wishes in the story, but I also wanted to show how many there are. So if you go back, you can kind of see like this zoom out of like seeing how many wishes, first class wishes are in this wish mine. Um, in this book, I should probably explain that wishes are sort of like a naturally occurring resource that's kind of exploited and, and bottled and sold as a commodity. Um, and then when it comes out, it kind of takes the place of like Arabic calligraphy. Uh, but it actually just takes the language of the land it's made of. So like um, on the panel on the bottom right, you can sort of see when they open this wish, it kind of goes through all of the different written languages that Egypt has had. Um, so again, this is not super relevant to you, but it is relevant to my graphic novel. Uh, so this is more of the process of drawing it. So usually when I'm drawing, I would have a panel with the program I use for references, so Visref on the side, and then I would be drawing on this program I use called Clip Studio Paint on the left. Um, it's a very crowded iPad display, uh, but I thought I would show it to you guys to kind of give you an idea of how I don't use one particular reference, but rather the vibe, <laughs> I guess, uh, to show things. Um, and I, I know I did take some of the hieroglyphs, but I was assuming that some of them would hopefully no one would actually try to read them because I'm sure some of them would be saying stuff about not wishes, I think. Um, although I did, I did use a hieroglyph to Coptic to Arabic dictionary to look at stuff that might be relevant to wishes for the image on the bottom right, uh, which was really fun. Um, so the idea of the swish mine is that the whole point of this basically is I've explained everything, but the main character is actually not any of the characters, and it's not the it's not the uh, archaeologist, not the Italian archaeologist, and it's not anyone else. It's actually uh, the man on the right in this image. So he's the father of the main character of part three, um, who, the one who kind of passes down the wishes onto him. And so the entire purpose of this is just to discover how a man who doesn't believe in wishes and doesn't like wishes ends up owning three first class wishes. Uh, and the idea is that uh, his father, who lives in Upper Egypt and is from a village similar to Kurna, but not quite the same, um, he led this dig basically and he was the one who discovered the tomb and he knew about it and he told the archaeologist about it um and in return the archaeologist takes three of the wishes that they've discovered and he gives them to him but because he is a religious man he has absolutely no use for them so he doesn't use them um and so basically the whole story is not about the man the archaeologists at all it's actually just about the well, it's about Shukri's father. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to, to call him to you guys, but Abu Shukri. Um, and so essentially, uh, the introduction of this very grand, like kind of tomb was meant to kind of serve as like a misdirection of people who have been familiar with the first two books uh, being thrown into like this different world and being like, oh, it's this guy. Oh, it's it's about this. And then they kind of see the origin of the wishes. Um, and because in the first two books, uh, we're kind of told that the wishes are Italian because they have an Italian label on them. Um, and so it was for me, I, I kind of wanted to show that the wishes were actually Egyptian all along. Um, but it's just that we didn't know. Um, anyway, so last year after I finished the book and after it was published, I actually did go back to the Valley of the Kings and this time I was like, I should probably visit the tombs because I spent so long looking at pictures of them. I was very familiar with the different tombs now. So I did visit Tutankhamun's tomb. And so all of you already know this, but it's, uh, it's obviously not quite the same as the one I used in the image. Um, but also I got to visit Carter's house and I took a picture at his desk and the, um, the guy there also let me wear a hat that he said was his. I'm uh -huh. not sure, what it is, but he was like, you can wear the hat. And I was like, okay, I didn't put a picture of that because I don't know if it's allowed. Um, <laughs> but basically I got to take proper pictures of all the references I'd used and it was really nice 
to visit them after having had like such a once you've drawn something you have a kind of like more intimate relationship with it because you've spent such a long time exploring all the different angles of it um so it was really nice to sort of go back there and and visit everything again after it was all done and also nice not to have to draw it uh but yeah that was basically my journey with this illustration um throughout like the book you can probably tell where I use different references like I did use a lot of the excavation videos and Carter's old videos um for references for the dig even though it was a few years a few decades later um but that was mainly what informed this part of the work I needed it to feel like familiar and also I wanted it, I used it sort of to contextualize the archaeological side of the wishes. Um, and part of it was part of the excavated Egypt project as well, which I'm part of, um, which I ended up participating in after I had finished the book because they were like, do you have anything about Egyptology? And I was like, well, my book kind of ends up discussing that, but by accident. Uh, so we sort of included that as part of the project, the page with the, um, this page in particular was colored for them. It's originally in black and white in the book. Uh, but that's it. Uh, thank you guys for listening. <laughs>